Where providers, I think, will, will struggle is they may get questions from patients now about data sharing and sharing their information. And I think from a patient standpoint, that's the key to me. Hi, and welcome to HIMSCast. I'm Kat Jersich, Senior Editor at Healthcare IT News. The Trusted Exchange Framework and Common Agreement, also known as TEFCA, outlines a common set of principles, terms, and conditions to support the development of a common agreement that would help enable nationwide exchange of electronic health information across disparate health information networks. So I just pulled that from the ONC website. And if this is your first time hearing about TEFCA or maybe even your third or fourth time, you might have some questions about it, but don't freak out. Here with me today to answer some of those questions and to discuss the implications of TEFCA and how it can be implemented is Dr. Dan Golder, principal at the healthcare consulting firm, Impact Advisors. Dr. Golder, thank you so much for being here with me today. Oh, thanks, Kat. Uh, great topic, and I appreciate you asking me to come on and have a little conversation on TEFCA. Of course, I'm really excited to speak with you because, like I said, um, I think a lot of folks may have be maybe new to TEFCA or maybe just learning about it. So let's just get started. Why don't you talk listeners through some of its basic tenets and what its goals are and where where we're at in terms of its progress? Yeah, and you know, you've made a really good point. I've, I've noticed in the regulatory space, this one hasn't gotten a lot of traction yet. And I think it's mm -hmm. important for folks to really uh, take some time to learn about. This is going to actually start this year um, and, and maybe not as rapidly as, as folks might like, but it's definitely slated to begin sometime this year. And you, you started with a really good intro too, right? This is envisioned as a single on-ramp to nationwide interoperability in, in a national HIE. And that's it in a nutshell. Uh, this started with the 21st Century Cures Act way back when, and that is really where this came from. And, and if you think about it, that's taken a long time for us to get to this stage. So there's been a lot of planning, a lot of discussion, a lot of topics that have been brought up and how best to structure this. So let me give you just a super high level breakdown. So TEFCA, I think of it as two parts. There's the TEF and the CA. <laughs> so the TEF is the framework and it's called the Trusted Exchange Framework. And that's I think of that as kind of the technical piece. And there's a, a QHIN technical framework that's actually been published in draft form that folks can go read. And I would encourage them to do that. Can I stop you for just a second? Will you define QHIN uh, for listeners? I, I, I will. I, I might not know that. I will kind of go through the layers there, but yeah, I agree <laughs> it's with true, you. Sorry. No, no, I'll, I'll, I'll fair game. Um, so well, well, we'll go. So the QHIN is a qualified health information network. Mm -hmm. um, the reason I was going to do that a little bit later is those, <laughs> that's subject to the rules of the CA, which is the common agreement, right? So the common agreement sets the ground rules. And I think of that as the legal piece. So we've got a legal piece and a technical piece. But then the recognized coordinating entity, the RCE, which is the Sequoia Project, um, they are the ones that set up the framework and the CA. And then they negotiate and contract with the QHINs. And those are the upper layer. Uh, there's going to be different numbers have been thrown about four, six, eight, thereabouts QHINs. So not every current HIE can become a QHIN. And QHINs will need to adhere to the terms of the common agreement and apply to the RCE, the coordinating entity, to be approved as a QHIN. That's what's really going to happen, hopefully, in the first quarter here, where the common agreement and the TEF, the Trusted Exchange Framework, will be finalized, and the Sequoia Project, the RCE, will start accepting QHIN applications and getting QHINs approved. And that's what gets the ball rolling. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. Once we've got the QHINs defined and functioning, then they can... I'd like to call them customers. They've used different kind of terms. There's participants and sub-participants and uh, participant members and individual users, but pretty much anyone can connect to TEFCA through a QHIN or through a subsidiary to a QHIN. So that's the structure in a nutshell, I think is a good way to think about it. That's really exciting, especially in terms of all of this being a way to finally achieve that interoperability that, of course, um, we've been working toward for years, if not decades. So 
given all that, that was a really great explanation. I appreciate it. So hopefully listeners who are not as familiar feel a little bit more caught up now. So how do you anticipate this affecting individual health systems? You know, the folks that maybe aren't quite at that QHIN level. Yeah, and there's going to be a lot of them. So this will uh, potentially fundamentally change how uh, hospitals and providers connect to HIEs. Hmm. So one of the first things we should remember is right now, there is no regulatory mandate for folks to participate in TEFCA. It's going to be optional. Now, having said that, uh, if I were a betting man, I would bet that it will become mandatory at some point in the future. Remember, we've got uh, promoting interoperability as part of uh, CMS rules, MIPS, MACRA. They now have an optional bidirectional HIE metric. So if you connect to an HIE, you get points for MIPS and MACRA. That probably is kind of the foot in the door. It will link up to TEFCA at some point. So mm. while it's optional now, folks should uh, recognize this is probably something that will become mandatory through some regulation. That's my guess, crystal ball. Now, organizations have to decide if TEFCA is a fit for them. So what do I mean by that? An organization can connect directly to a QHIN. Um, they could also connect to a sub layer, a participant layer. Um, and it's very complicated how they might benefit from this or, or maybe even sidestep maybe a state HIE. Hmm. A lot of hospitals are hooked up uh, to multiple HIEs to do different things right now. And those are the folks that might benefit the most from TEFCA. They might be able to now make one connection, maybe through a QHIN, or maybe through one of the participant HIEs and alleviate multiple connections. So that's potentially one of the real benefits I see here for folks. Um, the key here though, is gonna be cost. And, and I may talk about this a few times. Um, when you think about historically where HIEs have struggled, it's sustainability, right? Remember way back in the meaningful use days, we had beacon grants and there was funds from the government to get HIE started. Well, once those funds ran out, sustainability was a challenge. How do you pay the bills? I see the same kind of challenges with TEFCA, um, and we need to kind of figure those out because mm. QHINs are not allowed to charge fees to other QHINs, but they can charge fees to participants. So folks participating in, in TEFCA are going to have to really think about how do the fees, how are they structured, and does this make financial sense for me to join? Um, and that, that's just some of the things that we have to keep in mind. That's really interesting. So what are some of the other ways that health systems and organizations might be preparing in order to make that decision? Or are there technological considerations they should be making as well? Other, yeah, uh, absolutely. So the first thing, and we started off with this, right? Folks should be staying connected here. So many, many folks that I talk to are not Tefka tuned in. It's been out now for a couple of years. It's a very, very low key thing. Maybe that's partly because we're all worried about information blocking and some of the other regulatory environment uh, things that are going on, but TEFCA is coming. So stay connected. How do we do that? Sign up for the monthly RCE calls. Go to sequoiaproject.org. They have monthly calls. They're very informative. Organizations should start attending those and knowing what's going on there. The other thing, read these regulations, the common agreement, hmm. the uh, technical framework, get to know what's involved, especially the folks on your team that typically connect to HIEs now, maybe to a state HIE, those folks should be looking at those technical framework uh, documents and deciding how might we benefit from this. Second, get a hold of your current HIE connections to determine their plans. Some of them, I guarantee you are going to apply to become QHINs. So find out if they are. If they're not going to be a QHIN, what are their plans to connect to a QHIN? How will they leverage themselves in and therefore kind of grandfather you in? Mm -hmm. So understanding the current plans of your HIE and any costs that may be passed down through that. So understand that as well. The other big piece here, state regulations will come into play. So if a state regulation, for example, has an opt-in, opt-out requirement, um, that needs to be carried through. So we need to understand for each organization how their state laws intersect with the TEFCA laws and how that deals with it. Lastly, I'd say organizations need to start communicating with their providers and especially their patients. 
so that the patients are aware of this, that HIEs will change and how they share and approve their information being shared will become really, really important. That actually beautifully segues into my next question, which is how are patients and providers going to feel the effect of this? I think providers may be less so because they've already kind of restructured how they think about sharing because of the information blocking. Hmm. Um, Where providers, I think, will, will struggle is they may get questions from patients now about data sharing and sharing their information. And I think from a patient standpoint, that's the key to me. Um, And it's also key from information blocking. Patients are going to own with Tefka and information blocking access to their information. They're the ones that are going to say, yes, share it or don't share it. And typically now patients will say, yes, I want this shared. It's great. We have an app, but let's do it. Right. Um, They don't understand the privacy implications. And I think organizations are going to need to educate their patients on that. So things I think about with Tefka, right? There are opt-in, opt-out choices, and state law may supersede what Tefka thinks. So the question is, how will that be uh, administered? And who collects that opt-in, opt-out? It's probably going to be the organization of the providers. So people need to think of opt-in, opt-out. Consent as well. Who collects the consent for sharing information? And then with that come data exposure risks, right? Once the data has left the facility or left the building, it really can't be recalled. So Tefka has a provision where they are planning to implement opt-out, but it's only on a prospective basis. So Mm. what what that means is really once the data has been shared, they really can't pull it back. They can only prevent future data from being shared. So patients have to understand the data uses how their data is going to be exchanged and how important it is for them to maintain that security and privacy. And I think that's the big hurdle for patients. Absolutely. I mean, as you're talking, I'm just thinking of all the different exposure notifications we get on a weekly, sometimes daily basis about how data has been exposed. And I'm sh- and people are always saying that the more endpoints or the more ways that data is being shared, the greater the risk of exposure. Well, so think it through. That's a great example. So a patient allows information to be shared through Tefka and it gets out and it's shared back and forth and there's a data breach. Mm-hmm. Well, who is responsible for that? Is it Tefka? Is it the distal recipient? Is it the organization where the data originated? Is it the patient for allowing the opt-in and approving the consent? It's very unclear once that goes through the entire network if there's going to be any option for liability for a data breach, which we have now, we have some protections, but with Tefka, we may not. So that's a concern. That's really interesting. And of course, yeah, we've, we've been seeing patients who are trying to take things into their own hands by then suing the providers that breached the data. And um, I'm sure that that string of liability is going to be tested at some, in various capacities. <laughs> Yeah, it, it really is. And, you know, we talk a lot about APIs um, mm-hmm. and sharing data that way. Same challenges exist there. Patients approve their app on their phone and all of a sudden the data is gone. Gosh, absolutely. So switching gears a little bit, I want to talk a little bit more about QHINs because they're going to be the big boys uh, in this um, whole ecosystem. And if you're a potential QHIN, how should they be working to expand their uh, functional and technical capabilities in order to qualify? Yeah, and, and I think there's a lot of challenges there. So when you look at the use cases that are available in Tefka, uh, I don't believe any current HIE is really providing all of those use cases. Mm. So that's a new thing. They're going to have to really review those use cases and say, how do we step up our game to achieve those, right? There are some significant technical challenges now with um, becoming a QHIN primarily because this is going to be kind of a centralized gateway of exchange rather than a federated model, which means there's additional infrastructure that they're going to have to put in place, the QHINs, to kind of exchange and broker data. There will be significant costs there, and I'm worried because, again, sustainability is always on my mind, but we're adding costs by having that kind of an architecture. So it's a little bit challenging for me there. Uh, Another key piece is the RCE directory services. So there's a uniform directory that the RCE is going to establish that the QHINs will be required to contribute. And that's essentially patient and provider identifiers to try and help broker the exchanges for matching and identification, those kinds of things. Hmm. That is complicated. 
It's essentially like a universal EMPI system. Um, so trying to maintain that and keep it accurate and share it and exchange it live across the country and across the QHINs, I think technically will be very challenging. So that's, a, that's an issue. Um, we talked a little bit about privacy and security, but the QHINs are gonna have to have third party certifications for um, cybersecurity, and they're gonna have to undergo an annual security assessment. So there's a little bit more structure there than maybe they're used to. Um, the last one I wanna talk about here is something called individual access services, which is the only use case that is optional with Tefka. So not all QHINs have to do individual access services, IASs, which allow individuals, people maybe to connect their apps through Tefka and exchange information. Um, if they're not gonna make that mandatory, it kind of leads me to think, how are they gonna broker that if only one or two QHINs are providing IAS services? So it, it's a struggle for me to understand that. So I think organizations have to kind of figure that out. Um, and then the last thing, most important thing for QHINs, what's your sustainability plan? How are you gonna pay for these costs? What costs are you going to cascade down to your customers, your participants, sub-participants, individuals? Um, and what will that structure look like? How will we ensure these QHINs are financially viable in the future? I think mm. those are the things that I'd worry about if I were applying as a QHIN. Absolutely. Do you think that there's a plan to confirm with QHINs that they have that kind of sustainability in place? Because I'm just seeing all the ways that this could, maybe I'm a and a pessimist uh, comes from being a journalist, I guess, but I'm just seeing all the ways that this could go wrong, basically. I, I think there's a lot of potential here, but I would hope that when the applications for being a QHIN go through the RCE, that they do look at a sustainability plan and say, okay, where are you guys going to charge fees? How much are they going to be? How do you envision this coming together? I would hope as a QHIN, um, before I applied to become one, I'd almost have a business plan in place where I've already got agreements with some of the local state HIEs and maybe the larger health systems in the area to connect. Um, don't know yet. We don't have final uh, CA or TEF, car, TEF uh, framework documents, but um, I agree with you. I, I think the sustainability plan is the one thing that uh, could derail this. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, yeah, all those, I'm thinking of all those costs, especially with increasingly strained resources that healthcare systems are facing. Anyway, um, there yep. a bunch of different ways that I could see this becoming a little complicated. And uh, speaking of complicated, are there other hurdles to implementation across the board that you're kind of thinking about that you make sure, want to make sure you mention? You know, we, we talked about a, a little bit. So opt in, opt out, consent, mm -hmm. all of those technical pieces are, are really tricky. I think there's some liability potential risks here of, you know, who's liable if we have a data breach and a data exposure. I think that's a key piece. Um, there's traditional challenges that we haven't yet conquered with uh, Tufka. So user authentication. How do we make sure somebody logging in remotely is who they say they are? Uh, identity proofing, right? Uh, verifying a person is, is that person. Uh, and along with that patient matching, right? Making sure we don't co-mingle records for two John Smiths. Um, those kind of things are hurdles we've always had with HIEs. And we don't have good solutions yet with Tefka. I'm hoping we can kind of get through that. Maybe the directory services will provide some uh, help with there, with those, with those issues. Um, and the last one is data use. And what uses are we really going to allow for this data? There's even some discussion about potentially selling data is a way to help the sustainability plan. And if we de-identify and sell data, or if we don't, um, how do we structure that so people know about it and it are informed and say, you know what, I don't want my data to be shared that way and, and get out. Um, so the traditional hurdles, I think, that we've experienced with HIEs are still there. And, and again, sustainability is my big one. Absolutely. Wow, the idea of um, trying to pitch to patients that they that their de-identified data might be sold, maybe a bit of a, a big ask in, in, in some capacities. I guess it kind of depends on how you frame it. Yeah, you know, the other thing is we're talking about data that we haven't talked about yet is one more definition. So there is a thing called Tefka information, hmm. which is not... EPHI or EHI or any of the things we think about for information blocking, it's more encompassing. 
So Tefka information is all the data that would be exchanged across Tefka. But it's not just healthcare data, there's non-healthcare data that will be included. And that's a little bit vague. Um, one of the use cases is benefits determination where the government will look and say, hey, can I use this to determine um, like social security disability is one of the examples they give. But it could be for any benefit that the government is, is thinking of providing. So there will be additional information here somehow that will get exchanged, still pretty vague. And I, I think patients should understand um, those kind of things that are being exchanged as well as their healthcare data. Absolutely, that's a great point. Um, because again, uh, as somebody who covers privacy and security pretty regularly, I'm just yeah. thinking of all the ways that data needs to be kept secure. Yeah, I, I think if, if I could sum it up, I, I think there's so much potential here. Um, but I worry we might be moving a little too fast because I think some of those key things in security and privacy and sustainability haven't necessarily solved yet. And we're kind of figuring that out as we're building this. And my worry is, is maybe this is going a little too quick. Mm. Um, you know, we want to have a very robust interoperability solution, but at the same time, we really have to watch privacy and security of data. 100%. So I know we only have a couple minutes left here, but I did want to ask you, what are you excited about? Uh, what effect do you anticipate Tefka rollout having on interoperability? What are some of your hopes for this next year and maybe the next couple of years? Well, I, I think the potential here, we talked about it, is really enormous, right? This could be what we've all wanted, a one-stop shop where we can look at clinical information for any patient available at any time from any location. And we have essentially uh, a single medical record that's maintained through Tefka. The potential is huge. Uh, but you know, I've talked about some of the challenges too. And uh, I think this is going to be a slower rollout than people think, because we talked about it at the start. We've got all the layers. We've got to get the QHINs adopted. They have to sign up their participants. They've got to get state HIEs connected. So I think 2022 is going to be getting all those T's crossed and I's dotted. I don't really see this in full gear until next year at the earliest. So we'll see. Um, but I, I don't mind going a little bit slower. Um, I, I think that's what's got me excited is really the potential here, um, trying to get through those growing pains and getting everything kind of locked down for sustainability and, and some of the security things. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much again, Dr. Golder. This has been a great conversation. Oh, thank you. It, it's been great. Like I said, we could really talk about this and we're just scratching the surface. We could talk about this all day long. Really <laughs> encourage folks to go out and read about this. This is coming uh, it's going to be important to understand, and it's really going to be important to understand how it affects your organization. Absolutely. Well, listeners, I hope you leave this conversation ready to learn more and dive in. Dr. Golder, I'm sure you and I will be in touch in the future as well. And thank you all for listening. Uh, please, if you haven't already, subscribe to Hymnscast wherever you get your podcasts, and stay safe out there. Thank you.